In today's video, I'm going to answer very specific questions that people ask me a lot about living and moving to Virginia Beach and the cities around Virginia Beach. And we're starting right now. Hey, my name is Sam Sansalone, and I'm a real estate agent in the Hampton Roads area. That goes from Virginia Beach all the way up through Williamsburg, and I do videos every week about living and moving to the area. So today we're talking about those hard-hitting questions, the big questions people ask me all the time about living in Virginia Beach and what it's like to live here and move to the area. And so I thought I'd put all of these questions and answer them in one video so you can get a condensed version of what those big questions and those answers are to those questions. So number one is, Sam, how bad is the flooding really? I keep hearing about flooding, how bad is it? Okay. So I've talked about this in some videos and I do think that my opinions are evolving over time. So I used to think that flooding was not a big deal. However, I am being more aware now of how much the city of Virginia Beach and Norfolk and other cities around are focusing in on trying to mitigate flooding in the future and even currently. The reality is, will you experience flooding uh, problems in your house, like inside your house in Virginia Beach? The answer is likely no. Most of Virginia Beach is not going to have, you know, flood waters rising several feet up into, into people's houses, damaging, you know, property uh, and all that. It's not gonna be very uncommon. Now, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you on the map to show you the spots that I think would have the highest likelihood of that being the case uh, across the city of Virginia Beach. So when you're looking at the map, you see Virginia Beach uh, here. There you go. This whole thing right here. Now it's a huge city, right? Lots of land. And based on where you are in Virginia Beach, different types of flooding and different levels of concern of flooding can happen within the city limits. For example, if you live on the north section of Virginia Beach, near uh, the, the bay or near uh, the ocean front or near even the south side, near uh, Pungo even, near Back Bay down here, what will often happen is, is uh, ha you'll have wind driven flooding based on how the directions of the water comes up off of the shore or out of a water area into land. And depending on how much that land is already saturated, it can uh, increase the chances of flooding, whether it be more in the yard more in the streets, sometimes into housing se sections. But generally speaking, your biggest issues for flooding as far as houses go, to me, are going to be, if at all, are going to be possibly in parts of Pungo, all the way down the southeastern corner of Virginia Beach, and sometimes in the center part of the city over near Bow Creek, there has been some issues in Hurricane Matthew 2016. There have been some issues with, with houses being flooded in this section. So if you see a lot of renovated houses in the last six to seven years, good chance that that area might have been the, the center of a flooding issue with the houses and that's why they're all renovated inside. That's one thing. Now, if you go up to the northern sections, you'll see more up towards Lynn Haven, uh, well, the inlet, up near Chesapeake Bay, uh, near, near Chicks Beach, some very specific spots. Based on where the, the lakes are and where the water areas are, you might find spots that might not have good drainage, like with lots of concrete, lots of construction built up off of, you know, near these, these uh, uh, water areas. You might have some more issues as well, but even closer to the ocean front over near uh, 21st Street in this section right near where the tourist areas are, there's some spots as well. It's very specific, very localized, but if you look most of Virginia Beach, like the, the suburban areas, a lot of it, you'll see a lot of individual creeks and lakes and you'll see some small issues, but most of this area is not gonna be compromising your house specifically in general. I can say that and you say, well, Sam, you know, is that blanking, is that a blanket statement? Well, the reality is that, you know, could it happen? I guess so, but I've, in my experience, living here my whole life, in this whole area of my whole life, I've not seen it be a widespread problem with specific houses being flooded. Now, that ships over into yards being flooded and streets being flooded. This is more of a common thing, and you'll start seeing, do Google searches on Virginia Beach flooding, you'll see videos of news stations, and you'll talk, they'll talk about uh, specific roads that have lots of ponding and roadways. You'll see people talking, interviews, people living there in their houses and they're like, I haven't experienced this much flooding before and, and you know, cars that have, you know, foot or two water off the, off the street can, can mess up the cars, you can't get to your cars. That's not a citywide problem either, but it's very, still very specific, but a higher level of concern compared to houses flooding themselves. And also, if you go into Pungo, you've got marshy areas, you've got areas that 
that especially right off the bat of a back bay there's just more the, the water table as it is high anywhere in the city it's going to be higher in this south southern section anyway and so you'll see more wind driven flooding uh, storm water issues near near uh, sandbridge you'll see the same thing the the road to sandbridge can flood and so you just can't access those points so in general will your life be affected by flooding in virginia beach the answer is sort of mostly commuting mostly around your house but not usually necessarily your house itself. And so for me personally, I don't even think about it because when I'm driving through town, it's just not that big of a concern on a regular basis to even really think about. That's number one. Number two is, Sam, what's the jet noise really like and where are the worst parts of the jet noise? And so I wanna answer that by talk, showing you the ACUS jet noise zone map uh, because one thing about Virginia Beach is people often blanket it the entire city as being noisy. That's not the case either. And so if you look at the, the ACUS noise zone map right here, so you're coming in here and you'll see this whole, this is the Oceania Naval Air Station right here. And as you zoom out, most of the, like this is, this is East Virginia Beach, right? East of Virginia Beach. So looking at the map here, this is right around here. There's Oceana. So most of the area around Oceana has these color-coded areas where uh, the jets are the loudest and the closer you get to Oceana, the louder, the louder it gets. But as you get out away from there, the, you know, that green, those dark greens become less green, <laughs> almost white, right? And so as you leave into like Little Neck, parts of Kings Grant, um, parts of uh, Great Neck going up to the northern sections, you won't hear it much at all. But if you go further west, it's not even a thing. Like, so I grew up in the western section of Virginia Beach, never really noticed the jet noise at all. Now, if you talk to some people and they say, okay, hey, I was in Kempsville, and you st you might hear it some if you're in Kempsville, like over this this real edge right near the, the red, the, the dotted circle. It's real iffy over there, very, very little. But as you get closer to Oceana, into the, into the section near London Bridge, Lynn Haven, South Great Neck, this is where it gets pretty loud in southeastern Virginia Beach. And I would be very aware, if you're coming here and you haven't lived here before, you're coming here buying a house without having seen, seen it yet, this is something, if it bothers you, it would definitely bother me to, you know, to get something over in this section without doing more research, talking to neighbors, talking to people like that might work with, with you, just figuring out how loud that is. Maybe talk to your real estate agent and see if they can go go in that area when it, you, the jet might fly, see if they can record it and see how loud it is. So it definitely is not a, 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 an area-wide issue, but it definitely is a concern, especially on the eastern sections of Virginia Beach. Next is, is humidity that bad here? So humidity is a pretty rough thing here, and especially between June, July, and August, it's hot. Uh, and partly because the moisture of the, the content of the moisture in the area is already pretty high. And so you add heat to that, it's, it's uncomfortable. And so it can go from 80 to 90, 90 to 95, and 100 sometimes in July and August. And with that humidity in there, it can feel real sticky, really muggy. And I would just be very careful uh, about you know expecting real pleasant temperatures all year round. But I will say, between April, parts of April, a lot of April, May, and a lot of June, you will have very comfortable temperatures, especially May. May is my birth month and my favorite month of the year for temperatures. You know, mosquitoes can be a factor as well, but you know, having screened in porches can be very helpful. AC is a big deal. You'll use a lot of energy in that, that late June, June, July, and August time period for uh, AC. The next question is, Sam, does the entire city get busier uh, in tourist season, in the summertime? The great question because Virginia Beach is known for its tourism and high traffic. Lots of people coming here from different parts of the country, sometimes the world. But if you look at the oceanfront itself, and I'll show you the map again, the oceanfront itself, like where Virginia Beach, the actual beach is, on the far eastern section, this is where most of the tourism actually is. Uh, oceanfront and several blocks off. And then once you get out about a half a mile to a mile away from the oceanfront, things get to be more suburban and honestly just pretty casual and not real super hectic. And you know, people that come to the oceanfront uh, or to travel to the to Virginia Beach that stay in Virginia Beach, you'll see some people that will stay, for example, you know, off of the ocean, you know, maybe like a hotel, like 15 minutes from the from the beach. And that does happen. So there's a general heightened level of, of traffic in some spots on a very subtle stage, but not that much because re the reality is you're gonna feel it with traffic and most of the most of the uh, the year anyway without tourists being involved. Adding the tourist element to it, it really gets more focused on the beach itself and so it does get real con congested and uncomfortable sometimes with people at the beach 
uh, near the ocean front. But coming off of there, it's not to the same degree. And now if this has given you any value at all, I would really greatly appreciate it if you hit that like button, tap it, smash it, whatever, however you wanna do that. I really appreciate it. It helps YouTube uh, tell other people like you uh, that might like my videos as well. So I would greatly appreciate that. Which leads me to my next question answered, which is how will traffic affect my daily commute? How bad is it? Because people that come from Atlanta, come from DC, they're gonna say to this area, this place is a cakewalk. This is super simple. Don't give me this about this traffic sim. <laughs> On the flip side, people that come from more rural areas, more relaxed areas might come here and think that this is a madhouse. And I think that they both can be true. This area was designed for um, a lower amount of people, I think, uh, for what's here now. And as the population has grown, the, the roads have been starting to adjust and they have, they have expanded a lot of areas accordingly. However, at the same time, it's still not perfect. And you'll see a lot of, of areas that are congested a lot, especially 264 is the interstate going connecting from the east to the west uh, in Virginia Beach, as well as 64 going north and south, but it's actually 64 east and west. Don't, don't even get me started on that. Uh, and then a lot of the side roads, like uh, Route 58, which is Virginia Beach Boulevard, Military Highway running north and south on the on the west side of Virginia Beach, plenty of others, Lenny Haven Parkway, London Bridge Road. You'll see a lot of traffic just intermittently because there's lots of side roads, lots of highways off of the interstates uh, that can congest, especially during rush hour. So between like 7.15ish and about 8.30, 8.45, that's the, the the largest chance of getting back to back or bumper to bumper traffic or just lo longer congested uh, commute times to work. And so if you live, for example, in the center part of Virginia Beach, you're commuting to like the northwestern corner of Norfolk, like in, in, uh, in OB, for example, that's gonna take you during uh, rush hour, possibly 30 minutes, 25 minutes. But if it's a regular day, it might take you 18. You know, so it just depends, but expect some traffic, expect it, you know, wh wherever you are in Virginia Beach. But if you're gonna be on interstates, the exits can be congested and can be frustrating. They're enlarging those now, it's getting better, but it's still a general frustration. And even still, there's a spot in Eam River Road and Kempsville Road where they reconfigured this whole intersection because it was so backed up a lot coming off of the interstate, off of 64 right here. It was so backed up, they had to figure something out because there would be cars that's backed up, especially at five o'clock uh, in the evening during rush hour and so what they did was they changed it to where you now cannot uh, turn left uh, off of Indian River Road onto Kempsville Road. You have to literally drive through the intersection, make a U-turn, and then veer right onto Kempsville Road as well. So you're basically trying, they're trying to, to open up the, the uh, intersections right, you know, right where those two streets intersect so you're not getting as many cars backing up on the roads uh, farther away from those inter that intersection. So a good example of just, they're trying to reconfigure traffic to make it easier. But in general, expect traffic. It's just not gonna be like Atlanta. The next question is, Sam, can I get a nice house under $400,000? So that's, this is pretty generic of a question on one hand, but people are starting to ask this question. Prices have risen a lot in the last year, year and a half to two years. A house that used to be 325 now is closer to 400, maybe even higher than that in some cases. And so people are looking for nice housing for as low as possible. The reality is, depending on where you're looking, it can be hard. And so if you go on the, on the uh, eastern sections of Virginia Beach, the, most of the north end, like around the ocean front, you're talking nothing under five, unless you're talking condos, but condos are a very specific situation with more fees. But for single family houses, you're not mostly 600, 700 at the very start, going up to a million, two million, five, you know, five. It is, goes up real high, Croatan near Shadow Lawn. But going further over, you've got Great Neck and Little Neck that still often start over five. But 400 and less, you can be over in the the uh, western side of the area, in an area near Bay Bayside High School, uh, near Diamond Springs, Baker Road. You can still find single family houses anywhere from like the 285 ish range upwards to like the 400, uh, 425 range. And then further south, I still like parts of an area called Indian Lakes, specific neighborhood called Indian Lakes, which is over right near that intersection I was telling you about earlier, that that U-turn intersection. I like this because it has a has a neighborhood pool, but if they're closer together houses, but in general, you can get a nice house, you know, low, low 2,000 square footage in that 4, 425 range, and sometimes just under 400,000, and it's extremely central. So you'll find some spots closer to there in the four range as well. So if you want the hack to get the cheapest house, 
best house, I say for the price in best neighborhood, I would say just focus on some older neighborhoods like three bedroom, one and a half bath houses, four bedroom, one and a half bath houses. That one and a half bath can keep the prices lower, especially in a market like this, whether it be Central Virginia Beach and especially over near like Bow Creek, uh, the area we were talking about earlier, Chimney Hill, you can get houses in the mid 300s. Uh, so Central Virginia Beach, Northwest Virginia Beach, and Southwest Virginia Beach over near College Park near uh, Regent University, there are a few pockets as well that I think for under four, you can still get a nice house uh, and still accessible to lots of things. And so it's getting harder, but there are still some spots that will work. I would say if you're looking to move here and stay in that price range, make sure you focus on researching school districts. If you're interested in the school district uh, aspect of moving, just make sure you know which uh, school districts you're going to and how much that will influence your enjoyment in, of living in that area. Which leads me to my next question that is not asked enough, I don't think, is what are the common problems with houses in this area? And there are several, I think, that are worth mentioning. And I've talked about these in some cases. Number one is the older houses, 60s and prior, usually are the ones that have most cast iron piping coming to the street. And I've been making, making this more of a thing recently because more houses are built in that 60s and 50s time period in Virginia Beach. And I'm noticing there are, there are more drain lines going to the street that are getting blocked, corroded, or sometimes breaking down completely to where you have to replace that line to the street. And the reason this is important is not just the, the enjoyment of your house and functionality of your house, it's the cost to replace it because the insurance companies usually will not, not replace that line. You have to get separate insurance for that line. It's not very expensive, but you have to get that insurance if you want to insure that line. Otherwise, you're gonna be spending thousands of dollars to dig it out and replace it uh, whenever the time comes. So make sure that's one thing to keep in mind. Number two is, for the older houses as well, you've got still have to do a lot of electrical rewiring in some cases if they're really old. Uh, but you know, as we get into the 80s and 90s style houses, you're gonna have some more windows need, be, need to be replaced. You're gonna have uh, more HVAC systems need to be replaced as we get into the 2000s and new roofs because the new systems all need to be turned over about 20 years uh, ago. So those early 2000s houses need that. And with a lot of these older 60s and earlier houses, you'll also find a lot more DIY stuff going on in the electrical uh, systems, plumbing, uh, a lot of fixes that happened in these these types of houses. They may have been done uh, by DIY people that lived in the house, so be careful about some of that. We have a house in the 60s. We had to do a whole bunch of, of work to our house based on past uh, mistakes or things that people did DIY that we're now having to undo ourselves now. And another thing is termite moisture uh, issues that can come up in this area. This area I mentioned before is high moisture content, and so because of that, there's gonna be a lot more activity in the crawl spaces where there's more there's moisture damage or termite damage. So having a termite company come out on an annual basis, having a contract with them to come out and to uh, inspect the crawl space, see if there's any damage, make sure those, those areas are repaired or maintained well because you could have a perfectly well maintained house, but because of the moisture content in the air, even if you're not near the water, it can still create uh, moisture activity in the crawl space and then it leads to termites being attracted to your crawl space and then that can take cost thousands of dollars uh, to fix. But point being, whenever you get a house and buy a house, they likely there will likely be, be a requirement for a termite and moisture inspection uh, and a clear termite and moisture letter to be uh, issued for that house during the process, but most of the time. So if you're getting a house, make sure that you have that uh, and it's inspected by a reputable company because there is a little, a little bit of a racket sometimes in that, that business, so just be careful. And I've had some people you know, talk about water bugs, and you know, especially after it rains. So you'll see some bigger roaches that run through, for example, the ductwork or, or, or crawl through a hole somewhere. You will see that sometimes, especially in the, in the uh, warmer months, as, as it rains, you'll see more of these, these big water bugs run through houses and you might keep your house perfectly clean and still be dealing with this uh, every once in a while. So don't assume that it's, it's your fault. <laughs> in addition to that, you also have frogs. I've talked about frogs before, but frogs are finished room over garage. So finished rooms over the garage are, um, they're basically like bonus rooms. Sometimes they have like real large spaces. The ceilings are based on the roof lines. And so you'll see kind of like random, like vaulted ceilings sometimes. You'll see sometimes as the ceilings come down into the room. There are a lot of benefits to having a frog. One is it's um, often separate from the rest of the house and that it's right next to the garage. You can go into the garage, use steps up to the, to the frog and it's almost like a mother-in-law suite that's not, that's 
it's not traditional. It's like it's just separate bonus, whole separate area. It's not always a full eight or nine foot ceiling across the entire room, so it doesn't feel as big even though the square footage might look like it's big. When people see on the listings, for, so for example, if it's a four bedroom house, they see, oh, it's four bedrooms, that's great, but one of those rooms often is the frog. And so if you see a house that might look like uh, above the, the garage, there's a room or like some windows with a room, it's a good chance that could be a frog. So you need to find out if that house that may be listed as four or five bedrooms or whatever, uh, if that extra bedroom, that last bedroom is the frog because you might go in there expecting all traditional bedrooms, but it's not the same as the rest of the bedrooms are that might be in, this, in the same house. And if you want more information about uh, living in Virginia Beach or these areas around Virginia Beach, I've got videos here and here. You can click them and see more about details I've got about living in this area. And if you have any more questions about re relocating here and you need more specific advice, please let me know. I've got my contact information in the description. You can reach out to me at any point and I'll do it whatever I can to help you relocate to the area. And I will see you on the next video.